Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining APQC's webinar, 2020, What's Ahead for Process and Performance Management? As a reminder, audio is available through your computer speakers or dial-in lines, and all attendee lines are muted. The Q&A tool is located on your right of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them here, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded, and you will receive a copy of the slides, as well as the recording, in a few days. I would now like to pass the presentation off to today's speaker, APQC's Process and Performance Management Principal Research Lead, Holly Lycogland. Holly, take it away. Thank you, Madison, and thank you all for joining me today. So it's the time of year again where we take stock of the trends and challenges impacting process and performance management professionals for 2020. In other words, what are the trends and topics that are important to all of you? And even more importantly, what's impeding the effectiveness of your work? So what we're going to do today is talk about our annual the results from our annual priority survey that we conduct every year to understand those top challenges and key process and performance management topic areas as well as we usually include some kind of special interest section um, that looks at topics that are relevant as well for our audience. Um, for this year, the kind of special interest areas that we looked at were things such as focus, what are, you know, what is the, the primary goal of process teams? What are their measures of success? Kind of looking and seeing how well those are aligned, as well as technology. What technologies are impacting process professionals and what part of their work are being directly impacted on those. So we're going to look at the top three challenges and some of the key topic areas, look at some practical tips and some of the resources we have available already to answer some of those challenges and help you along your way. Look at those insights um, from that special interest section, and we're, then we're going to wrap up with what research can you expect from us in 2020. So Starting off, um, this is the topic areas and the priorities that came out from the survey responses. As you can see, most of the process and performance management professionals are really focused on those core capabilities in these two areas. So business process management and continuous improvement um, are kind of key foundational elements of process work. And data and analytics and measurement are also at the core of performance management. So we're really going to just focus on these four today. Um, you can see challenges and the rest of the information in these other topic areas in the priority survey summary, which we'll make sure you guys get a link to after the webinar. So what I want to do is start with those top two areas for process management. So what are those challenges in business process management as well as continuous improvement? Now you can see the top three challenges for business process management here on the left hand side. And what we're really seeing is that organizations continue to stress kind of high value process work, as well as looking about getting leadership support and those governance components. So I'm talk a little bit about each one of those and kind of what is going on and involved with those. So the first one here is defining and mapping end-to-end -end processes. And this has been steadily growing as a priority for organizations over the last couple of years. Um, end-to-end -end processes quickly becoming the norm for how organizations manage their work. Um, there's still some problems and places that organizations struggle when they're looking at things end to end. And there's really three major sub challenges associated with this. And the first one is defining the scope. Organizations sometimes struggle with defining what's in and what's out of an end to end process. Does it have to cross multiple functions? Um, how do we go about putting kind of boundaries on this? And then the next two are kind of interrelated. Um, the next one is how do we identify process owners? As we said, a lot of end-to-end -end processes tend to cross operational silos. So how do we make sure we're picking the right role to be able to have ownership over something that involves multiple functions? And there's that similar challenge when we're looking at KPIs and measures. Again, because we're looking at multiple functions, how do we make sure we have the right measures that show the health of that overall process. So and that's definitely a big place for people as they continue to dive into these end-to-ends that they struggle with. And the second one is actually something that's new, 
Um, we haven't seen this one come up in the priorities for a very, very long time, and that's establishing process governance structures. So as process management um, continues to embed itself in the organization and drive a lot of strategic value, um, as well as helping the organization with some of its big projects, how do we make sure that there's accountability, oversight, and ensure that process work has access to the resources that it needs? So that is definitely becoming something that's growing um, and making sure we have those structures embedded within the organization, their efforts as well. And the last one is one of our evergreen challenges, and that's how do we engage leadership? So how do we make sure that we get leadership to care about process work and see the value in it? Because again, that helps us make sure we're actually moving beyond just small incremental changes, to be able to be a driver for the overall effectiveness of the business and getting access and buy-in across the organization because we have that engagement. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, these are our continuous improvement top three challenges. And again, we're kind of seeing that most of these are, are repeat challenges because organizations continue to get stymied by really poor engagement. We don't really understand how to get people into shifting their cultural thinking, um, as well as how do we go about with measurement and prioritization of all the plethora of potential opportunities out there. So when we're talking about creating that culture of continuous improvement, what we're really talking about is how do we go about with change so that we make sure employees have the tools, the skills, and in most cases also the decision rights to help identify things that need to be changed. And how can they do this in the flow of work, which helps keep improvement opportunities organic, as well as continue to keep our frontline employees engaged in this idea. The second one here is identifying, prioritizing, and selecting those opportunities. As we all know, there's a plethora of potential things that can be improved in the organization. But how do we go about making sure that we're making objective decisions so that our, um, our opportunities are prioritized based on their value, their potential risk, um, as well as making sure that these decisions are made in a way that improvements in one area aren't going to cause problems in another area. So, and again, if we can go about identifying some structure about how we go about doing this. And the new one for continuous improvement this year is actually capturing the ROI of those improvement opportunities. So sometimes continuous improvement efforts struggle with understanding and showing here's the, the value or here is the actual financial benefit that we've gotten by investing in improving those opportunities. And those two can tie together really, really well um, by using you know, a lot of project management methodologies as well as well-established business cases that can help us translate that information. So what, you know, into dollar savings or additional revenue. So overall, um, we see a lot of similar trends that are continuing year after year. Um, but that governance and, and that ROI are both kind of new this year. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see those. So we've talked about the challenges. Um, let's move on and talk about some of the solutions. So the first one here is that biggest ticket item we've seen organization, and that's developing end-to-end -end processes. So we talked a little bit about some of the challenges, but why are people so focused on end-to-end -end these days? Um, a lot of the times we, we saw originally was the primary driver was connecting the work we do in the organization to customer value. But that was only kind of the first step. We see organizations also embracing end to end for a couple of other reasons. Again, it helps us make sure that handoffs between departments are go smoother, um, as well as being able to process up that improvement opportunity issues. So if we can see the holistic process, when we make up improvements in one of the process steps or something like that, we can have that big picture to see how it's going to affect the entire value chain and other people within it. But even more importantly, what we've seen is technology has really been helping drive that focus on end-to-end -end processes. At kind of like the most surface level, we see that a lot of ERP systems are coming with embedded end-to-end -end processes these days. So record to report, order to cash, uh, a lot of those CRM, oh, sorry, ERPs have those built into them. So that's driving how people start thinking about the work that's being accomplished. But other technologies are also very reliant on that end-to-end -end perspective. 
So as we're developing new automation pieces or other systems, uh, even data management, how do we connect all of those pieces together so we don't just, you know, have the resulting of having, again, instead of transformation, isolated technology projects that continue to not prove out their value because they don't understand how they fit together. I think one of the best examples I saw of an organization who has kind of addressed some of those challenges with end-to-end -end was CMI. Um, so for them, they were not only just embarking on an ERP system upgrade, they also were going through a digital transformation. And it quickly became apparent to them that what they needed to do was restructure their thinking to end-to-end -to -end processes. But again, they also had to deal with a lot of those three major issues that we talked about. So how do we know where the scope is? So the first thing they did was actually kind of scour the world um, and started looking and seeing what are those common end-to-ends. So they did a collection and they went through and they identified, I think it was over 20 potential end-to-end -end processes. Um, so that's a lot for an organization to take on. So the next phase of what they did was, okay, so we want to create clarity on what's important to us. So they worked in collaboration with their steering committee um, and they developed a matrix based on all of those 20. And they had selection criteria based on how complex is the process? What's its potential impact on the organization? And how does it align to our strategic goals as an organization and through our digital transformation? And they worked again with their, their steering committee there from business leaders to help identify and prioritize those. And they came down with two or three ones they wanted to focus on first. So what they then did was, again, develop their process teams, picked, say, I think they started with some of the early ones like order to cash, and then developed workshops where they used things like process classification framework and those high level ones they saw out in uh, their research and then just started mapping those together with their process owners, as well as their stewards, their business leads. Um, and their super users or the subject matter experts to go about doing that. So that helped them in a lot of ways. It helped them understand what was in, what was out, and help them prioritize their efforts so that it was most beneficial to the organization. And the second big thing is that engage to embed a culture. Now, establishing a continuous improvement culture, like I said, is an ongoing struggle. Now, as the goal of process management is typically to improve how organizations work, we have to get this right. Otherwise, a lot of the work is just kind of working on standardization and putting maps and things on a shelf that may not get used. Um, however, one of the things we also found is that when we talk about the success of process improvement work in an organization, the culture plays a really big factor in it. Um, and the, going on some of the research we did on correlations, what we did find was that you know, improvement cultures can range from non-existent to where process work gets done, we map, we put it on there, or we standardize it in a tool, and it never gets touched again, to organizations that have it in the flow of work, where they've trained their staff on process work, trained their staff on improvements and their criteria, and make it organic to help kind of improve as we go. So, but when it comes to a culture shift, a lot of organizations have to walk before they can run. So what we saw when we did that correlation analysis is that organizations started seeing improvements in their process programs efficiency by doing simple things such as um, scheduling reviews. So for every one of their processes, they would have a review schedule cycle. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had a great approach to this um, in that kind of mid-level there. So what they would do once they would do process work with their owners, they would then schedule a specific improvement cycle. So every, I think it was year or so, the process owner had got a notification from the process team that was scheduled to identify and assess their processes. They also provided those process owners with what's acceptable variance for the measures so that they knew what would trigger an improvement cycle or not. Um, but what we saw was the biggest lift was when organizations actually moved into that in the flow work. I think their improvement efficiency lifted up by about 25% when it was in the flow of work. Um, and that just, again, means working with your employees to make sure that they are empowered to conduct process improvements. Uh, UPS, I think, is a great example of an organization who's done that part really, really well. Um, a couple of years ago, they knew that they needed to reassess how they were doing process work. 
um, because they wanted to be able to embed it and, and work with the employees so that it became something that was embedded in their culture and shift to process thinking. So they kind of went about, took a step back, did a lot of research and focus groups and conversations with their employees and restructured so that there was three key capabilities that process teams had. One of them was improvement services, so they could actually work and do projects with their clients to improve projects. Um, business process management, so how do they go about creating that visibility, embedding these things across the organization. But their biggest drive and their biggest hit was their process center of excellence. And that was how they empowered their employees through guidelines, standards, tools, um, and this very specific types of trainings based on personas to help people understand their role and get the skills they need to internalize and take that process work on. And then the last one is aligning governance to purpose. I think there's probably as many governance structures out there for process management as there are process teams. And we see organizations really they tend to fall into three categories. One is a strong centralized organization where the process team takes care of everything and all the governance lies with them. Then we have decentralized, where you know, different departments will have their own process teams. There's no connection. Um, but the ones we see that are most successful are the federated. And those are the ones that combine a centralized process team to provide governance and support with decentralized ownership and governance within the business. And for that to work effectively, you need a couple of different roles. So within the process, core process team, you need to make sure you have a couple of skill sets. The analytics ability, so you know, BAs or anybody else who can understand process analysis techniques, some consultative skills to work with the business, um, as well as these days some technology skills. So either BPMN expertise or even RPA expertise. But within the business, you also usually need two major things. A steering committee that is comprised of leadership, across the different business groups to help provide that holistic picture of what process work needs to be done to make sure that it can align with the organization's goal, as well as process owners within the business who are taking care of the accountability and the governance for those processes. So those are just a couple of tips and solutions for addressing some of those major challenges we see for the process area. So, now we've talked about the process side of the house. So I want to talk about the performance side of the house next. Um, I do want to make sure we have one clarification. When we're talking about performance management. We're talking about the organization or business performance management. So everything from that business perspective on how do we go about achieving our goals and improving how the business runs. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion when we talk about the HR performance management, which is more about the individual level. So we're looking more macro rather than micro here. And the two big topic areas in this, as we said, was data and analytics and measurement. So in 2019, data analytics came back with a vengeance as far as challenges and priorities go. And it's maintained its momentum even into this year. Now, why is data and analytics persisting as such a big challenge for organizations? I think it's because digital work and data-driven decision-making are no longer competitive advantages. They are now how we do business, and they rely on a core competency in data and analytics. A lot of organizations have bought off-the-shelf technologies or are working with AI or predictive analytics, um, but they haven't established or, or gotten their data houses in order enough to be able to effectively execute those. So the top three challenges this year in data analytics are the exact same ones we saw last year. And that first one is establishing a data-driven culture. So again, we're talking about how do we engage people so they understand what data analytics is and are comfortable with actively using data to drive their decision-making. So, and being able to be comfortable with that information and the way they execute their work. And establishing a roadmap is also kind of tricky because that kind of ties back into that understanding Right, we have to understand what analytics is, how it can be applied, and not even and even just as importantly, what analytics cannot solve. And that information and that kind of training and understanding then helps us understand and pick out so what are the priorities in the organization 
that we need analytics capabilities for most. So once we know what it can do, what types of decisions are most important to the organization? Do we need it to support specific technology adoptions and help us then build out in stages how do we want to go about doing that? And then the last one there is aggregating analysis into a dashboard. Um, this is taking disparate information and putting it at the fingertip of our end users, right? Previously, reports have been in Excel sheets that don't maybe get updated on a regular basis, or we still use formal PowerPoints in monthly meetings. But how do we go about making sure decision makers have the information they need in real time or in much shorter cycles? And that creates a whole bunch of sub challenges as well. So, you know, we need to understand what measures should be included in our dashboards. What level of detail is necessary in these dashboards for our stakeholders? Because one that's for the executive team it probably doesn't need to be quite as detailed as for our supervisors and our managers. And other questions like, do we want this to be a self-service option? Or is this something we need to review and have our data team meet with executives you know, every two weeks to go through and, and talk about the findings? And then finally, how do we automate this type of reporting? Now, organizations have a lot of success in, in some of the financial measures and things like that, but they're still struggling to capture other types of measures and feed those into those data reports. Like I said, these are the exact same challenges we saw last year. And I really think that a lot of reasons we continue to see these struggles with the data analytics challenges is actually associated with measurement. So if organizations are still struggling with measurement, that means they may not have the foundation they need to execute their data analytics programs effectively. So for example, um, organizations are still struggling with what's the right measures. So we can't collect the right data if we don't know what measures that we need to use to make decisions in the organization. So organizations need to look at things such as incorporating those non-financial measures. <clears throat> Financial measures are great and they're very important to decision makers, but they tend to be lagging indicators and they only tell part of the story. So organizations can struggle with identifying, well, how do we go about incorporating and what are those other measures we should include? And tied to that is then how do we identify the right mix as far as not just category, but leading, lagging, and in process so that we make sure that we have process controls in place that are based on measures so that we're not just reacting to any problems that arise. Instead, we can proactively address issues before they become a crisis. And similar to data analytics, how do we use technology to aggregate this information for reporting? Do we, how do we go about doing it as maybe automatic reports or into those dashboard formats? One definite thing we saw different from last year is there was a lot of emphasis on shift in performance management measurement culture. So people are starting to get more comfortable with the idea of measures managing the work that they do. Um, and we've started to see a little less emphasis on that in general. We still see it in the data-driven part, but not necessarily so much in the measurement side of the house. Um, but we do start seeing this use of technology aggregating from the measurement perspective is also a new challenge. So, I think that you, as we go through the years, measurement and data and analytics are, are beginning to merge into where you know you cannot have one without the other, and eventually they should just be a cohesive whole for the organization. So again, we talked about the measure, uh, the challenges. What are some of the solutions that we've seen? Well, this first one is the big one. So how do we make analytics work in the organization? So Late last year, we did a big study on trends in data analytics, and we conducted some correlation analysis to see what was actually driving the effectiveness of data teams. And there's probably a lot of the drivers you probably think about. So things like having a value proposition for your data team, that's a no-brainer. Making sure you have a formal team so people know who to go to. Having that executive level support, as we know, is super important success stories and being able to tell stories using data visualization. Those all came up significant, but the real drivers, the ones that had the best lift when we're looking at that effectiveness, were actually one-on-one -on -one engagements, demonstrable ROI, and a structured change management plan. So why is a formal change management plan so important here? Because what we're talking about is changing norms 
and behaviors of how people do things. How do they make their decisions? So the organizations that focus on that adoption are deliberately engaging their employees and their leadership to change how they do these things. So, and again, that kind of uses your typical change management plan, right? Two-way communications so that you're establishing a conversation, training your employees, training them on high level, you know, what is analytics, how can we use it, um, and some basics. So what is, you know, the basics of the difference between descriptive and predictive? How can you have assurance in that type of information? Rewards are always also super effective for people and as far as the early adoption stages go. And then monitoring that engagement to make sure people are using the analytics and that it's not you know, one and done after you've done that initial contact. One-on-one -on -one engagements are really great because they provide that, that connectivity with the one -on -one with the employees and leadership. It gives them an opportunity to not only have a dialogue, provide coaching on these things, but also pull in concrete examples that are meaningful to that audience to show them the value. And it also helps you overcome, help overcome things like misunderstandings and misconceptions about data and analytics and what it can do as well as what it means to them. And then demonstrable ROI, again, if we can show the value of something in financial values, then it's easier to get people on board and, and be able to then show them why they should do it. Getting the right mix is also a really big thing when we're talking about measurement. We did a study on operational KPIs, and what we found was that organizations tend to use four criteria to help them select the right measures for their organization. And those four measures are reliability. Can we consistently gather inputs for this measure? Can, do we have access to the information we need for it? Impact, is it directly linked to an organizational goal? And kind of sub-questions on that is, is it strategic in nature? Can we directly link it to a strategic objective? Does it connect to cost savings or revenue? Is there a financial component to it? And also, how does it link directly to either customer or employee-focused improvements? So making sure you kind of have that balanced scorecard mix of when assessing the impact. Ease is the third one, and that's how easy is it for us to not only access the information, but analyze it? Is the information, is the data coming from all the different sources in the same format? Or do we have to go through and, and make sure and massage it so it's all in the same form? Are people measuring cycle time in days in one department and hours in another? And do we have to go through and convert that information so we can use that data effectively? And then finally, familiarity. How is this measure, is this a measure we've used historically? Is it something that's commonly used in our industry? And a lot of that is because that helps us understand the ability to do benchmarking, um, as well as be able to look for historical trends and what we're trying to measure, as well as um, making sure that we may have the data already. Um, one of the things that we see, saw that really elevated people in their measure mix was that ability to track trends over time. Um, again, because it gives us the bigger picture when we're looking at measurements, but it also gives us the opportunity to create a baseline before we start creating goals in that topic area. And the last solution was measuring performance success. In that same study we did on trends in data and analytics, what we really found was that best practice organizations actually used a really good mix of measures to track their, their data and analytics programs. And they fall into kind of three big buckets to make sure that we're, we're capturing the overall picture of the impact of those programs. And the first one is adoption or behavior. Again, because we're still trying to change the culture in organizations, we have to be very deliberate about monitoring that. And adoption and behavioral change measures are things that help us understand how people are using the analytics, are they using it, and the adoption rates. So some of the example measures we saw organizations use in that category are things like action items. Are people developing action items based on data analytics projects for their dashboards? And is it increasing? Are people using it more and coming up with more solutions and potentials because of it? Utilization and consumption numbers. Okay, we've rolled out a dashboard. Who's using it? How often are they using it? Is it only specific groups? Um, and then number of service requests is another big one. How often are our data teams getting requests for projects? And even more importantly, how often are they getting requests from projects from the same group? So we're getting repeat business. 
The second one is analytics performance. So that really just lets us know how well the analytics is doing against what it promised. And a couple of easy measures on that we see groups do is prediction or model accuracy. So how close to the mark was the prediction from the analysis to what happened? Cost benefit analysis, again, the ROI there. And probably the fuzziest when we're talking about performance is your stakeholder satisfaction. How happy are your end users with the outputs that they're getting and the impact it's making on their job? And then business results. Um, again, we always wanna tie it back to what's driving the organization. So, you know, a lot of these measures are typically associated with the projects, um, but things like revenue, cost, customer satisfaction or retention, and cycle time. So what are kind of the impacts and how it's doing to the business? So as I said, here's the biggest challenges that we've seen this year. Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here and move into our special interest section. So like I said, we always kind of include, and I like quote unquote, special interest section. That changes from year to year. Um, and a lot of this is basically based on what are some research topics that we are thinking about conducting for the year. We wanna get some high level insights or information that'll help us scope out those projects. But we also wanna make sure they're beneficial to you as well. So we also wanna make sure that they provide information that's valuable to all of you. And like I said earlier, we really focused on three major topics this year within that. Focus, so what is the purpose of process teams? Measures, how are they measuring themselves? And then that technology component as well. So the first one is what is the purpose of process work, right? Great news is 96% of the respondents said they actually had a top focus for their process efforts, which is great if, in my perspective, because we've always seen organizations who have their process teams get scattered and there's no real cohesion or, or value they can bring to the, to the organization because they haven't figured out or they haven't clearly articulated what is their primary purpose. What is the number one thing that they're providing for the organization? Um, and the number one here is also near and dear to my heart and makes me super happy because it's showing that organized process teams are kind of moving away from that incremental improvement to being able to be aligned to providing tangible value to their organizations by supporting the strategic initiatives. Now, a lot of that has to do with a lot of strategic initiatives are focused on typically three topics at this point. One is some kind of transformation. We're changing the business to stay competitive. Um, and our digital transformation is another big driver. You know, we're trying to understand an aut automation and tap into new technologies to streamline process work or to streamline how things get done. And then the other one is, again, trying to stay competitive by being lean. So cost effectiveness and making sure we can do more with less either through technology or just smarter efforts in our business. So that was incredibly heartening to see. Um, the second one there is also another really great one because we're seeing that process teams can also be very, very focused on improving what we need for our customers. And that's making sure that they have high quality products as well as services and that we're delighting our customers as a way of being competitive. And that links directly to the next one, which is that customer experience. So we're trying to make sure that our processes and work we do at all levels of the organization link back to that customer value. And then the fourth one is supporting that culture of continuous improvement. So how do we go about embedding in the organization this idea of doing things better every day? So again, there's a lot of really great things here. Um, we did ask things like bottom line uh, improvements and things like that, and those came out further down as far as the focus goes. But it looks like process teams are, are starting to kind of really make inroads as far as the strategic providers for their organizations. The next big question then is, okay, so we know why we're doing process work. How are we measuring it? And again, also really great news. Um, the majority of organizations have explicit measures for how they're tracking the work the process teams do. A few years ago, when we did similar studies, the it was the other way around, where the majority of people didn't have clear, explicit measures for their process team's work. So being able to see that there is this um, active use, active way of providing that value through measurement 
is also incredibly a positive sign. Now, the bad news is, is that there seems to be a little bit of misalignment between what our focus is and what we're measuring for success. So a lot of, the, especially the top two measures, we see are very bottom line um, improvement style measures, right? So we're trying to make sure we're saving money and improving efficiency, which tend to be aligned again to those kind of bottom line savings. It isn't until you get into like quality and customer satisfaction, my apologies, that you start to see some of those more strategic measures of success coming out. Um, so big picture, sh big picture is there's a lot of great things because we're actually being able to provide value to organizations through the measures that we're doing and we have those measures, um, but organizations probably should also take a look to make sure that what they're measuring their success on aligns to that value proposition the process teams are showing their organizations. And then the last one is looking at the impact of technology on process work. So again, we know that technology is a major driver in organizations these days. So it makes sense that technology is also impacting how we do our work. Um, it came it really is no surprise then that 55% of the respondents said that the impact of technology on their work was going to be significant over the next couple of years. So then we wanted to kind of dive in a little bit more and understand, okay, so what technologies are impacting and where are they impacting the cycle of process work? So the technologies are kind of really not surprising. Process automation and data management leading the way there are kind of similar to what we've seen over the last couple of years when we're talking about not just process work, but digital transformation work. A lot of organizations are still looking for those easy wins um, as far as cost reductions, FTER reductions, and improved efficiency through automation efforts. And as we know, organizations continue to struggle with their data management. Um, it's still a big part of organizations kind of trying to figure out how do we go about getting data out of people's spreadsheets, getting it into a cohesive message, and, and also how do we go about making sure that we're doing this in a strategic manner? So those make a lot of sense. It's interesting to also see collaboration platforms and their impact on the process work. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these apply to each of the areas in the, here in a second. And with cloud computing, again, more and more applications and information in the organizations are moving to the cloud, so that's going to impact what we do. And data visualization tools are implicitly useful for those of us doing process and performance management work because they help us simplify messages and tell great stories for our decision makers using data in an effective method. So what are those topic areas in process management that are most impacted? So the two areas that are, are impacted the most are monitoring and optimization. And both of those have really strong links to data. So it kind of makes sense as you know, data becomes much more prevalent and much more the norm in organizations. Us being able to use those technologies that help drive that um, are, really does make sense in optimization and monitoring. Um, it helps us not only just be able to understand and make objective decisions about health, improvement opportunities, but dig in to help understand what are those root causes and what is going on behind the scenes as well. Kind of two areas that are going to be moderately impacted is things like mapping and modeling. So tools like process mining help organizations kind of get a head start on some of that work, um, as well as those collaboration platforms. Those collaboration platforms help us work with our stakeholders who could be not on site with us. They could be in another part of the world or just another area. So those collaboration platforms are making that kind of workshopping and, and going together with our subject matter experts much more smoothly. Analysis, again, we're relying on data. Um, but again, sometimes data is not always useful as far as digging into those root causes. So we still need to be able to rely on some of those human interaction methodology, so fishbone analysis, the five whys, all of that that lets us get that contextual information that may help us figure out what we need to improve and why. And then implementation. So the execution of the processes and related training and support through things like those collaboration tools are also a great win for process teams. So I know one of the big questions that we've gotten um, ever since actually the report went live is, okay, so we're talking about a lot of these 
technologies, these are pretty standard at this point in time as far as they've been out there in the marketplace for a while, a lot of organizations are using them. But what about process mining? What about AI? And what about machine learning? So though they haven't made the top list this year, I full well see a lot of organizations embracing them even more so over the next 18 months. Um, part of that is because all of those rely on a strong data foundation. Um, you have to be able to have the data and the information you necessarily have to be able to feed into those. And again, it's the, that garbage in, garbage out. Until we get our data houses in order, we can't effectively do any of those things. Now, the nice thing that we've seen, especially in all three of those areas, is that the vendors in those topics are getting smarter. They're also making those technologies a lot more user-friendly, so you do not have to be a developer to, to access and execute those methodologies. Um, and even with like process mining, we're seeing a lot of the BPM providers now start building that in as a capability within their technologies as well. So overall, um, I think we're still seeing a steady pace as far as what technology is impacting us, but I definitely think that's going to be shifting here over the next few next year or so. So sum up. Overall, we have a lot of steady any change, uh, challenges from 2019. And N is still a big ticket item for process teams and it continues to grow as important for the organization. We need to build on that foundation of analytics. We, we need to get our measurement ideas and how we, what measures and data we wanna collect so that our analytics teams are working with the right information. Um, and again, we continue to need to work on that culture aspect, whether it's continuous improvement or data-driven culture. We have a responsibility to engage with people, use sound change management principles to help bring them along for the journey. Um, so those are also really, really important. Um, process teams, again, I suggest that we take a look at, you know, what is the purpose of our what we do and double check to make sure that our measures are aligned effectively to show the value of what we're offering the organization. And overall technology, automation, data management, all of these things are gonna to continue to grow in their impact in the work we do, either as tools we use to solve problems or tools we use to help us in our daily jobs. So that is all of kind of the overview of what the survey had to say. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, I was wrong. Uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. So what can you guys expect from us this year? Um, so we've got a full docket of research projects scheduled out. Um, our people of process study is continuing. We're at the interview phase, so we're having one-on-one -on -one interviews with process folks to help understand and, and capture their personal process journey. So if any of you are available or would like to share that information, we're still looking for more people to interview. Uh, we're going to have more end-to-end -end process maps and measures. So we got the first five done last year. And we're hoping to get at least five more, probably more, in other topic areas this year. So we will be continuing to push on those. Um, process mining, like I said, it is becoming much more viable for a lot of organizations. So we plan on doing a short study to look at what is it, do's and don'ts, best practices for it, as well as some user examples for how people applied it and what are their lessons learned for doing it. That intersection of data, process, and information, I think is a really big topic that's starting to come about. Um, process and data work hand in hand to help the organization understand what it needs to do, how it needs to work. Um, but so many organizations do not either A, have a formal strategy for either one of them, or if they do, they're not entwined at all. So we're gonna look and see how, you know, best practice organizations go about tackling those two things together. The fundamentals of measurement is going to look at things such as how do we pick the right KPIs, how do we go about embedding those measures, and how do we work on making sure that they're driving decision, as well as some of the technology implement, implement technology implementation steps. So how do we go about what are some new do's and don'ts for establishing dashboards and things like that. Um, in Q3, we're planning on getting together a, an assessment for business process management maturity based on the seven tenets. So organizations can take this assessment to understand where their process management strengths and weaknesses are to help them drive maturity throughout their work. And then finally, we're gonna be working with our knowledge management team on a productivity study that's gonna look at how does knowledge and process management 
specifically help improve employee productivity. And again, we'll have many more case studies as well as other topics. So um, we look forward to a very fruitful year. And now, um, are there any questions? Thanks, Holly, for that great presentation. We've had a couple come in so far, and I wanted to remind anybody that's on the webinar today to use the Q&A tool located in your GoToPanel to submit those questions, and we will get to those as they come in. So the first one, um, they wanted to know where all of the data was collected that was presented in today's presentation. Okay. All of the data from today's presentation came from our annual priority survey. So towards the end of last year, we launched out the survey to process and perform uh, performance professionals to um, answer their, you know, what are their top challenges as well as the answers to the sub questions we discussed. So this is something we do every year. We usually schedule it in late November, early December. Um, so we, I think we've been doing this since what, 2014, Madison? That sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I hope that answers the question. And we will include a link to that full survey summary report in the follow-up. Perfect. The next um, question, or it's kind of a comment, but I'd be interested to get your opinion here. Um, from a strategic point of view, it can get tough when goals, especially strategic ones, tend to change with the organization's change in direction, things like that. Any suggestions on where to start or how to um, reevaluate those goals in a way that doesn't completely redo your process management or performance management plan? Um, I think you can also put it down as a mix. So you can have some steady eddy measures that you do year on year over year. And some of those will be those cost effectiveness and the throughputs and the kind of the traditional measures of value for process work. Um, but you can also then, you know, along with the, the annual planning process, also identify some value ones. So what, how are they, you know, they're pretty similar to the ones that the organization is going to be tracking. So like customer satisfaction is always a shoe in for, for what the, some one of the KPIs your organization is going to be tracking. Um, so kind of look at some of those big picture ones and see if you can find a way to connect the work that the process team's doing to those. I hope that helps. Yeah, that does sound like a good place to start. Um, and it looks like the last question we've had come in so far is they want to know what kind of software organizations are using. Um, I know we don't do a ton of research on technology-specific items, but I don't know if you have any thoughts there. Oh, um, actually, uh, could you clarify what type of software you're talking about? Because there's a lot of ones we talked about. So like the automation software, PPMM software, process mining, things along those lines. Let me see if our participant responds here real quick. Yeah. We do tend to try to be vendor agnostic. Um, there's a lot of great places out there to look for specific vendors and a partner. Their magic quadrants are always great for any of these topic areas. So you can look for BPMN, you can look at process mining, you can look at what's going on with the AI and the automation um, as well to look at, you know, they do a really good job of assessing the vendors on criteria so you can help identify which ones are best fit for your organization, such as capabilities, features, price points, things like that. Okay, while we're waiting to hear back from that participant, we do have another, a couple other questions coming in. So the first one is, what is the key to engage business unit leaders quickly on the new management approaches using data? Oh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> some of it is usually what we've seen is starting with one or two pilot programs. So who, find out who your enthusiasts are. Find out who the people who are actively data embracers because um, that'll help you just get some of those quick wins as far as engagement goes. Um, also, if you could pick somebody who is an influencer with their peers, that's another great approach because then you're not only just you pushing the information, the success stories, they're going to be talking to their peers about the benefits of it as well. So um, it's a very, it's kind of calculated, but being able to start with those champions of change at that level does a lot to get you in. Um, and being able to show that value. The pilot programs are also really great because they give you the success stories early um, as well. So uh, relying on some champions in the executive team is usually probably the best bet as far as getting in quickly. 
Um, and then doing some of those town halls or those one-on-ones with executive teams or the leadership teams on, you know, here's this capability we've got, here's, you know, we want to just have a conversation and a quick training for those groups. All right, and we got a response. So the registrant is wanting to know more about BPM software specifically. Ah, okay. There's a ton of them out there. Um, and I'm sh I can follow up in the follow-up email with you guys and send out. I don't specifically prefer to promote any one or over another, um, but we've definitely worked with quite a few groups. Synavio is one of them. Perhaps, I think was it. Casper is another one. Um, there's a Eris is another BPMM out there. Um, and a lot of them actually are great because um, some of the work we've done with those groups is just helping provide them access so that their BPMM software is compatible with things like the process classification framework. So if you're already using the framework in your process work, um, it's usually a lot easier to integrate with some of those. And we can, again, like I said, we can send a follow up link to Gartner stuff. Gartner is much better at that kind of technical suggestions than I am. All right, I'll be sure to get that link in the follow-up email. Um, the other question we have is, there's a lot of talk about the economy can have an impact on organizations in terms of where they put their focus. So, um, do you think there was a shift at all from maybe cost control to cost reduction or from soft to hard savings that you noticed um, that maybe people focused more on process improvement efforts or instead of process performance, just to kind of be more on the cost, um, looking more at cost now with the economy and such? I definitely think that has an influence on where organizations focus as far as the cost goes. Um, and then doing a lot of that focus on the improvement aspect. Unfortunately, if you focus on the improvement without the foundation aspects of it, you still wind up getting chaos out of it. Um, and I think that is something that it's harder for, for organizations to kind of accept. Because um, if you don't do all of your process front work, your improvements are gonna be uh, non-sustainable. But yeah, I definitely feel that cost improvement and cost reduction is, is definitely an impact because of that, also because of the digital transformations that organizations are going through, um, which is partially reactive to that, but also partially, ooh, there's really cool tools we can use now. Um, that also aligns with a lot of that cost reduction. Um, so it's the other thing we've seen is the kind of the flip side of that is where organizations are also looking for sustainable growth. So some of it is cost reduction and process improvement. Um, because of that economy impact, the other parts of it is uh, how can we grow sustainably without adding costs? And that's where we see a lot of those improvements as well. So how do we reduce some of the FTE hours people are spending on transactionals um, to being able to grow and have them be able to cover more or provide additional value to the organization as well? So there's a positive and a negative aspect to that. All right, any other questions? No, it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. I didn't know if you had any next step suggestions or anything um, as we wrap up here today. Definitely. So next steps, like I said, we're gonna send you guys this link. Um, check out the rest of the information on this topic. Um, we actually are publishing a manufacturing versus services look at the data later today, um, as well as providing some additional insights and some articles around these challenges in, some, in survey summaries. Um, you can also stay up to date on the process and performance management research projects. So that long list I sent you guys, um, you can see where they're at um, and, and stay up to date on anything else we change or, or add into those, those research expectations. Um, but like I said before, with like the people process interview, we learn best by learning from all of you. Um, so if you have a success story or if you have a case study or even want to participate in that people process, please contact me, I'm always happy. Like I said, I learn most from you guys above everything else. So it helps us you know, share best practices and lessons learned and help one another along. So I hope you guys found some value in this and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Holly. And just wanted to let everyone know um, the links weren't clickable through GoToWebinar, but in the PDF of the slides that you'll get following um, today's webinar, you'll be able to access all of the links throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar presentation there. So you should receive an email within the next few days that has links to the webinar recording as well as the slides from today and 
some of those follow-up articles and resources that Holly mentioned. I do want to remind everyone to connect with us on our social media sites. We post upcoming events, webinars, recent research, and things like that. So be sure to connect with us there. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar, and I hope to, you have a wonderful afternoon.